All right. All right. Welcome to Parents and Residents. My name is Emily DeMeo, and I'm the Vice President of the Sports Medicine Interest Group for the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. I'm currently a third year medical student at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. This evening, I will serve as your moderator for sports specialization, the past, present, and future of single sport training. If you have questions for our speakers at any point during the webinar, please enter them in the chat area on the webinar screen so we can discuss them during our question and answer session. Following our webinar, please join us in our one hour Twitter chat on sports specialization using the hashtag YESSSS2020. Sports specialization, defined as the intense training in a single sport to the exclusion of other types of physical activity, is increasingly common during childhood and early adolescence. Sports specialization may be a natural pathway for elite participation in certain individual sports that require advanced technical skills, such as tennis and gymnastics. However, the benefits and risks of early specialization are not fully known. Thus, we will delve into this topic with our two wonderful presenters. First, I will introduce you to Dr. Niru Jianthi, our first speaker this evening. This introduction is especially meaningful to me, given that Dr. Jayanthi was instrumental in the founding of the AMSSM MSIG. I have also had the opportunity to join in Dr. Jayanthi's sports specialization research here at Emory. Dr. Jayanthi leads Emory's tennis medicine program, is the director of Emory Sports Medicine Research and Education, and co-directs Emory's youth sports medicine program. He is considered one of the country's leading experts on youth sports health, injuries, and sports training patterns, as well as an international leader in tennis medicine. He is the immediate past president of the International Society for Tennis Medicine and Science and a certified US PTA and PTR teaching professional. He's also been a volunteer physician for the Association of Tennis Professionals for 20 years serves as a medical advisor for the Women's Tennis Association Player Development Panel, and is on the commission for the International Tennis Performance Association. He has been selected to the board of directors for the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine twice, and served as a consultant for the American Academy of Pediatrics, Council on Sports Medicine and Fitness, the Aspen Institute Sport and Society Program, and Mom's Team. Dr. Jayanthi has won multiple AMSSM Foundation Research Grants for his collaborative research on early sports specialization training and overuse injury in young athletes. He previously was the Medical Director of Primary Care Sports Medicine at Loyola University Chicago for 12 years, where he was voted a top doctor in the Chicagoland suburbs prior to being recruited to Emory. He has already been a peer-selected top doctor in Atlanta since 2017. Dr. Jayanthi has been a course director over 30 times and has been an invited speaker over 170 times to local and regional conferences, as well as at national academy conferences, international sports medicine conferences, international Olympic committee congresses, and also at numerous tennis medicine, USTA, USPTA, and PTR conferences. He has regularly helped with medical care at the NFL Combine, Chicago Marathon, Division I NCAA Athletics, and numerous high schools. He is currently a team physician for the Atlanta Braves, the Gwinnett Stripers, a AAA Braves affiliate, Georgia Tech University, Johns Creek High School, and Pinecrest High School. He has numerous publications, book chapters, and is a reviewer of several sports medicine journals and is an active teaching faculty at Emory University. Dr. Jayanthi has been featured and or appeared on over 150 media outlets, including HBO Real Sports, ESPN, NPR, New York Times, Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, WGN News Sports Radio, WGN TV News' Medical Watch, ABC News, CBS National Radio, 11 Alive, Fox News, WGN and CLTV's Living Healthy, XM Radio, and numerous other media outlets for his innovative research findings on junior tennis players and young athletes. 
Dr. Jayanthi enjoys seeing active patients of all ages and specializes in young athletes and tennis players. He lives in Johns Creek and sees patients at Emory Johns Creek and Emory Atlanta Hawks sports medicine locations. Now I'll go ahead and introduce our second speaker, Dr. Stephanie Klee Thermos. Dr. Klee Thermos serves as research director for the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine's Collaborative Research Network and is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where the Collaborative Research Network is housed. Her background includes expertise in biostatistics and research methods. Dr. Klee Thermos's research focuses on the application of statistical methodology and design to sports medicine topics, including youth sports specialization and participation, concussion and running biomechanics. She's published numerous manuscripts and abstracts in the area of youth sports specialization and hosted an AMSSM research summit in April 2019 on youth early sports specialization. So now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Jayanthi to get us started on this evening's webinar. Thank you for your attendance. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you, Emily. I know my wife didn't even say that many things on her wedding day about me, that was nice. So uh, I better make this good for everyone. So welcome all of you that can hear, and hopefully you can hear me just fine. Um, the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine is a passionate area for me. Um, when I sat on the board for six years, every meeting I would push for something about the medical students and the residents actually, and I was always about the learner. So every meeting I had a new proposal to try to get more students involved. So it's just my pleasure to see this grow and, and um, <clears throat> see so many students that are interested in. Many of you may not choose sports medicine. I hope a lot of you do. Uh, but as long as you understand what it is that we end up doing, especially as a non-surgical sports physician um, and a primary care sports physician, I think then we've really accomplished something. So please stay involved, stay connected. The next meeting's in, in Atlanta. So if you see me, come say hi and say, hey, I saw you in the webinar and you know, uh, love to chat and find out about what you do. So um, this has really grown, this topic has grown into a big beast over the last 15 years or so that I've been involved in it. And I'll try to give you a brief run through and we have a couple other, uh, you know, that we're going to be doing more stuff, including a Twitter chat afterwards with uh, Stephanie and Alan Bishop. Um, I do a lot with a lot of different organizations, all volunteer to help try to change how we're changing the culture of youth sports, um, not just at the local level, but at the academy level, but everyone can play a role in changing youth sports. Um, so really, how do we get here? This is our goals for just this brief talk here. And then what is the scope of the whole problem? And where does this go from here? Like, what is our future? And I think Amos is playing a very large role in this. And some of the stuff that Stephanie will talk about um, as she goes into her, into her talk. Um, the main question that people ask is, what are the, really the health consequences of, of this youth sports, like single sport um, specialized training? And you got to be careful when you do this to not just follow only the media and figure out, you know, and just, in, in fact, us as medical people bias it a little bit. We have to follow the data and that's hopefully what we'll be able to present, not just our opinions about what we think things should be like. Um, and I think a lot of it started, you know, way back when with a study uh, that was in the UK actually about 25 or 30 years ago called Training of Young Athletes. And they looked at four sports and, and the whole culture was very different then. They looked at swimming, tennis, gymnastics, and soccer. And these kids back then had low injury rates. They only they only participated about 10 hours a week. And that's actually quite low given today's environment. And they actually, the, the conclusion of this really fantastic longitudinal study of about, about 450 athletes was they just had mostly positive benefits with sport with low injury rates. Wouldn't that be great if that was our society now, which is actually probably the opposite of that with concerning you know, uh, training volumes, high exposure and high injury rates. We'll go over some of those things, but that's the cultural change. And the cultural changes happen particularly in America and it's kids that are younger and younger being asked to do things and not just asked, but being required to do things at younger ages. And I think that's where the crux of it is. Is it self-directed or not? What are the consequences of doing that? And there's individual decisions and, and you know, just remember sometimes you have to specialize. You have to specialize in most every sport. The question is, you know, at what point is it different for each sport? So if we look at when people specialize, typically, um, you have a couple of models. One is the late specialization model, which is 
wait till you get to be late adolescence and maybe you're 16 years old or older and then um and then you pull that trigger and see where that red line is and that's kind of this slow accumulation of volume and then eventually you just pull the trigger and you guys probably as medical students might even be too young to know of that culture where where maybe uh you know coach alan bishop and dr you know stephanie um you know grew up where and me where you actually a lot of kids play three sports and they would kind of you know at 15 or 16 say you know what i might just do one sport um but now we've actually changed the model where that starts at early adolescence and i believe and i just had a um you know, they just uh, get interviewed by different media and the Zion Williamson thing came up with his return to, um, you know, from his injury. And, and in that, uh, you know, I actually quoted that. I estimate that we've actually moved the dial. We've aged our athletes about three to four years based on how our culture has changed. We're, we're actually not waiting until 16. We're barely making it to 12. And so at the end of it, the things we're seeing are happening four years earlier. You have 12 year olds having what 16 year olds used to have. And 20 year olds look like 25 year olds. And so w I think we have to be really sensitive to that when we're designing you know, programs. And, you know, and the areas that we talk about aren't just like, hey, your kneecap hurts and you might be sore for a few days. These are serious overuse injury locations that we've, we've published on. And, and all these may require one to six months of time away from the sport. And that's meaningful. If you talk to someone like a performance person, like you know, Coach Allen, um, hey, when you're out for six months and you can't get better, uh, because of an injury, you're getting worse, and that's that's really a big detriment. And those are the things we want to try to try to highlight. And and uh, that's my biggest concern. I've always said this sports specialization issue isn't really an injury issue; it's an athlete development issue. And if you want to do the optimum pathway, you have to figure out what keeps you in the sport engaged um, for as long as possible without having these injuries. And who is that person? It was really a young female athlete who plays an individual technical sport and specializes at a young age, this would be like a young tennis player, does more hours per week than their age of weekly training, doesn't play anything for fun, the family has lots of money, and they do this more than eight months a year. And you go down that checklist, and that's every single high-risk factor we have for developing overuse and serious overuse injuries. Um, this topic, which I thought 15 years ago and then 10 years ago, would just be a fleeting topic, has really taken me around the world where I've spoken on probably no less than 100 times and um, and I thought it was just an American problem. And then if you look at the map, these are all little places around the world where I've had to speak. And this is just like McDonald's is spread across the rest of the world. The rest of the world likes to do whatever we do. And so when we eat a lot of cheeseburgers, they start eating cheeseburgers. And that's what's happened is we brought, I think, our culture around the world. And I don't think it was like that before. And as uh, um, Emily outlined, you know, I've had no less than probably about 150 media interviews on this. And just recently, New York Times and Real Sports. and. Why do I like that? Is because we speak to each other and medical people all the time, and I get to speak to a lot of people who agree with me. But that's actually not where we're gonna make change. It's, it's actually making change with people who don't agree with you, and why I thought it was really important to bring people like Coach Alan Bishop and, and a lot of followers. Not that they necessarily don't disagree, but they have to focus on a different thing, and that is performance and getting the athletes to perform. And we have to come together, come up with a solution. So whenever I get a call from media, I pick up the phone right away because we're trying to send the right messages um and so this has been so big i actually think and i've said this before that uh you know how they did the movie uh concussion for will smith they're actually going to do one on sports specialization i think i think they're gonna have dev patel be me so i can't wait till this comes out i think it's going to come out later this year i'm kidding actually there's no there's no movie um coming out on me but um so hopefully one day though maybe they will and you know it'll be like the secret like playing one sport might actually lead to serious serious injuries Shh, I got to go to the FBI are here. Um, so uh, how did this all start for me? I have to proudly say that this started with a medical student project that was turned down at our School of Medicine for a summer research grant. And it crushed me uh, because I thought it was a really nice idea to look at a case control analysis of sports specialization. And I was so mad. I went to my chair and said, just fund me $2,500 for the summer. We'll make this. We'll make our medical school regret ever telling a medical student that they couldn't get a research grant for the summer. And that turned into multiple AMSM foundation grants and all this traction that you've seen from here. And I really truthfully couldn't have done it without AMSM and their foundation grants to keep this, we expanded to a multi-site study, we followed them for, we, we had this, um, the population going for up to five years. We did three year follow-up and we're still finishing up our fifth manuscript out of it. And 
this is where a lot of the initial work came from. So I really am always happy to say that AMSM has played a large role in the development of the research of, of sports specialization. Um, and then the, some simple findings of this was that, look, if you specialize in a single sport, um, you increase your risk of overuse injury, but not just that serious overuse injury. And some simple rules, this is from a video that I'm not playing on my PDF right now, but you know, it decreased your opportunities for free play and you end up training more hours per week than your age. And those are all indicators of risk for developing injury. And then when we did look at from other aspects like performance, when we published uh, 2013, we did an evidence-based review. And at that time, no, you know, only a couple of small studies suggested there might be a performance benefit from training early, um, earlier than 12 years old intensely. And then um, I think Stephanie will go over some details on performance in sports specialization and the, and the publication that we got out of that. And CAA says that most, um, most athletes specialize under the 12 years old, which makes it hard to convince them that it's not a good idea. And the trouble sports are really soccer and tennis, gymnastics, and even basketball. And when some of these team sports don't make sense to me uh, about why you would specialize. John D. Fiore, one of our past presidents who does work on this, that student athletes specialize later than their non-athlete college peers. And it's actually more important to have a professional athlete as a, as a mom or a dad. <laughs> actually, that's your best bet. Have good genes. Um, and the rates, like how often, it, so we see about a third of them are highly specialized these days in our data. That number fluctuates a little bit, but that's a large number when we look at the whole pot. And that whole pot could be as many as 60 million kids. And if you think a third of them are getting specialized, or even a, a less, you know, a smaller number, it's still millions of kids out there who are being asked to do things that we think may not be in their best interest. And I actually think some of these models are really made with a complete disregard for the health effects of young athletes and more of a financial uh, model than anything. So I think there is a financial model, not an athlete development model in most situations when we're asking kids to do things way beyond what they should be doing at ages much younger. We, meaning AMSM, put out a position statement um, on overuse injuries about seven years ago now, uh, we may update about half of all injuries were overuse in young athletes, which is a large number. I'd actually be curious to see if that number has even grown now. And so when you design programs and, and folks are designing programs and coaches and everything, you ask yourself, is this a participation program or performance program, or maybe both? Are you trying to make one in a million like Roger Federer or get a million kids playing sports? And really that's our goal. And so when you devise a performance program, you take risks, you, you, you get more attrition, you get more injuries, and you get probably less uh, you know, quality of life. And if it's a participation-based program, you ask kids to self-direct and play more, and they're more likely to stay within their sport. So you're taking bigger risks with performance. They may still exist. There may be times where you have to do that, but, but you have to be careful because you're making a, a risk about sacrificing other young athletes. And this was proved in a five-year follow-up study in France where they looked at kids who sampled sports at young ages, these were like uh, elementary school kids, and the kids who sample sports five years later were more likely to continue playing. The kids who specialized in sport when they were early in elementary school were not more likely to participate, but they were more likely to be performance athletes. So like I said, there's a risk of doing that. You get a narrower group. And then, you know, if it's your kid who gets, you know, pulled out and quit sports, then it's a really big problem. And when we, you know, we, you know, help guests edit our BDSM editorial on this, and and while they wanted me to talk about sports specialization, I keep going back to the fact that 70% of kids drop out by 13 years old. And that's actually big, a bigger number. If you end up getting overuse injury and you keep playing sports, it's one thing. But if you're losing kids over and over again, that's when I get more worried. And especially young girls. <clears throat> so many, we've, I've been a part of probably almost 10 position statements or reviews on this topic. And most everyone agrees that you should delay sports specialization at the academy level perhaps to at least 12 years old, but we just don't have the data to show it. And that's where a lot of the new research should go. And, and Stephanie will go over what, what, what other sports are doing and what data has been out there. But this is a big gap in research, especially basketball doesn't care what tennis does and tennis doesn't care what gymnastics does. And so you have to do sport by sport, I believe. And so, you know, your entry into sport, you might have exceptions, maybe gymnastics and swimming and diving are ones that are early entry sports, but most of them actually are either middle or late adolescence. And maybe some team sports can make it through middle adolescence in today's culture, but you know, we have to uh, um, be a little patient. But I really believe the physical athletic sports, they can wait, even until 
you know, you get into late adolescence, senior year, even right until college. And why do we do all this stuff? I mean, the key thing for me is sport is about physical activity and getting more people engaged in physical activity. Then you get some that do competitive youth sports and then some that really want to be performance oriented. And then you get this small niche of, you know, athletes who are high level and perhaps go on and get college scholarships, which again, as many of you know, is one or 2%. And you, you do this to maintain participation, but the goal is really get lots of kids involved. When only a fraction of our kids have an opportunity to be involved, the system is, it's actually a system problem, not an individual problem. And so that's where we want to work. And then so the other part of it, of course, we always get asked, you know, I always get asked, does this lead to increased injury risk? And, you know, again, going back to those AMSM, you know, grants, we were able to initially help to find maybe sports specialization as being something that is one of three elements, you know, choosing a main sport and then quitting all other sports to say, I will do this one sport and then do your year round training and competition uh, eight months or greater. And if you did all three of those things, you were highly specialized. And it's those kids who are the most at risk, the highly specialized ones. And you don't have to look at the small table, never put small tables in, in, in slides like I did, but you have to summarize here. And uh, um, you know, it's simple. The more specialized you are, the more at risk you are. So the more highly specialized athletes, it's called dose dependence. So it's a pretty, pretty straight, almost a linear relationship. And also, the more act physical activity, the more risk if you're specialized, particularly if you don't have much free play. If you play basketball all the time and you play for fun, you can actually accumulate more hours per week and still be less at risk for serious overuse injury. So it's really not just how much you do, it's what you do. And then, you know, we are uh, under review for a three year follow up study that um, Dr. Stephanie and I are publishing feverishly after our eighth revision, uh, we're almost there. And we're seeing very similar results. And we're seeing kids as we follow them. I mean, it's almost like our 50% rule, about half of them end up getting injured over a study period and when we follow them over these three years. So we're seeing consistent patterns of, hey, when you get these kids and they're highly specialized and they're the high overuse injury risk, you're gonna see them again. And that's why I stay busy because once I meet a kid who has an overuse injury, I have a pretty good chance. I'm gonna I have a 50-50 chance I'm gonna see them again. So it's great for business, right? But we should not be doing it to create our own business. We should do it to help, help, help these kids stay active far beyond that. And we're seeing the same findings where it's more than double the risk of overuse injury um, for, uh, um, for these specialized kids over, over a study period. So this is the first longitudinal study in, in the clinic that you'll see published when we get this out there mm -hmm. over, over a few year period. So I always say, you know, you got to work on changing the athlete and helping them change their mentality, but you got to change the whole environment around it. Because you can't tell a 14 year old, like a 15 year old high level tennis kid today, I'm like, just go ahead and, and don't worry, don't specialize. And why don't you, you're nationally ranked in tennis, but why don't you start playing basketball and see how you do make, make the team. You got to accept they're specialized and work on the environment that they're in, work with the coaches, the parents, the other kids around them. And that, that's education. So you gotta do both and as injury reduction with education. So I don't think you can prevent injuries. Look, those of us who are gonna be doctors or, or you know, medical providers in this field are gonna be busy. So you should focus on not injury, uh, you can't prevent, but injury reduction just to reduce the amount that you're seeing. And that's really what I focus on. And again, you know, and Dr. Stephanie and I, um, you know, um, co-published uh, um, another uh, manuscript looking at whether you can follow, we have like these kind of 10 commandment rules and follow them over time and see if delivering this every six months would actually reduce injury risk. And so uh, I won't get into the details of all the, uh, um, um, of the findings, except that in my opinion, over time, um, when the group that got serial um, um, counseling online, they had lower injury rates over time. The reason why is still to be debated, as Stephanie knows, but if you look at the graph, actually here, lower graph, that ends up, uh, you see the injury rates being lower. And I think it's sort of like quitting smoking or, um, or trying to do weight reduction. You need some intervention. I mean, you can't just tell a kid once, hey, look, maybe you shouldn't play as much. You have to keep going back every three months, every six months. And so I develop relationships with the kids that I have. Um, and then that, so that involves, like again, changing the whole environment around them. Uh, that, if you're really gonna make a change. 
And then uh, uh, most recently fascinating stuff that I actually ended up talking about the Zion Williamson article is that for, for the first time we're seeing sports specialization, and Coach Allen might be interested in this, uh, resulting core differences. In other words, the, the control of your lower body is not as good in those that specialize, particularly young female athletes in basketball, soccer, and volleyball. And that's a striking finding. Why is that? Because I've always, I and myself and many and several other investigators have shown sports specialization is always an overuse injury problem. Now we're seeing neuromuscular deficits, which usually contribute to ACL tears. So let's see that tiny little arrow here. Maybe perhaps we'll see neuromuscular deficits as a precursor to overuse injuries. And maybe that's what we'll be studying because we've always used that when, you, when your knees are landing prop, improperly and all these things as a precursor to getting ACL tears. But I'm actually asking my investigators to do biomechanical studies to start looking at this pathway. And I actually think we're going to probably end up finding something with that. And that means correcting neuromuscular deficits may not just reduce in ACL injury risk, but perhaps overuse injury risk. So that's where I think the future may go with some of this. So it actually expands much more than just your typical overuse injury. And, you know, again, if you're talking to families and kids about uh, not specializing because of an injury risk, you're going to go nowhere. You know, David Bell and some researchers at Wisconsin, where Stephanie is, have shown in good survey studies that they know it. We have some studies that show parents are aware of this. They just don't care. <laughs> and families don't care. They're actually, they are looking at performance benefits. So what we need to do is talk about what are the benefits of multi-sport play from a performance point of view, and then work with the coaches to help on why that's good. Because no one, people usually don't get scared of injury until they have the injury. And so that, then by then it's too late. So, so I think that's our task. And that's why it's, again, important to have uh, folks like Coach Allen Bishop here and also a lot of people who, who follow him and, and trust some of his opinions. And so like I said before, I, I talked about socioeconomic factors, which is actually, you know, we published a study looking at those that specialize, you know, I'm sorry, those that came from lower socioeconomic status tended to have uh, lower risk um, uh, for serious obese injury. Why? Even though they played more, they played more because they wanted to on their own. And so I call it the mo money, mo problems rule. And so when we have money, we think we're doing, a, we're doing our kids a service by signing them up and making them go to practice all the time. But those days of, you know, just loving the sport and going out on your own are some, kind of disappearing. So we want to reintroduce self-directed free play. When you are playing for fun, you self-regulate. And there are specialized sand models which show that you can accumulate hours. You don't need a coach around you to do that. You need some instruction, but you can do a lot of this stuff on your own. And then when you're tired and you feel like you're going to get yourself hurt, then you just stop and you go home. Or if you have a bad day, you don't show up that day. It's okay. So I think as a younger age, we could use a lot more of that. So I'll leave it. Like, where is the future with all this and new sports research before I hand it off to Dr. Stephanie here is um, we know that we have some reasonable, like we call it level B and level C, evidence, which is good, but not that there's a risk of injury and you may not, you know, get the best skill development, although we may update this because Dr. Stephanie will show some new slides. What we don't know is what, what happens with each type of sport, what happens with their quality of life, which is a standardized way to assess like how, how much people like their life. Um, and then, you know, what's the appropriate performance load? You can't, you know, it's easy to not get hurt. You just have to sit on the couch all day long and have no exposure, but you got to challenge these kids to get better. And so what's the appropriate dose? And so we have a couple of different studies that are trying to answer these questions, but they need to be 30 studies, one for basketball, one for tennis, one for gymnastics. So everyone needs to be, you know, kind of looked at in that way, I believe. And then what makes a happy young athlete? You know, these, you saw my boys earlier, I guess those on the webinar, but we got to figure out what makes kids happy. And because this is really about what, what makes kids happy, not what makes adults happy. And, you know, right now, there's several studies out there showing that college athletics leads to poor quality of life in athletes, which is really sad because you're going through this whole process and you end up finding out that after this whole exhausting process, you actually would have done better as a quality of life by not playing college athletics, which is everyone's dream. And then, so now we're doing quality of life studies, which Emily, uh, you know, Emily DeMaio is, uh, you know, a key part of looking at the young athlete and following them up the years and seeing what is their quality of life? Because I'm actually concerned that they may not have that great a quality of life too in today's culture. And so it's more than just the injury, but realize it's not all bad news. You can do things to make things better. Uh, I help with the WTA uh, player development panel. One of those things is 
is looking at age eligibility rules and high level athletes like Coco Goff, who some of you guys know. And we have rules in place to limit a lot of things, particularly competition loads, which a lot of other people in the media have complained about. But guess what? Have protected her and many other young female athletes who've had long, long careers. And we don't have those kind of rules in a lot of youth sports. Um, so uh, we don't have them at, even at, at the USTA junior level, even though we have at the professional level. So I think we have to take more care of our young athletes. And yeah, you can specialize and, and still actually have a positive experience. We have two studies that show there's reasonable quality of life. If your child is directing the experiences and you have a supportive environment, and we know that you know, um, if you have a resilient kid with a supportive environment, not emphasized on winning, it is possible for athletes to specialize and still have a positive experience. But unfortunately, most people don't have that really nice environment. You know, I just saw a mom today with a tough kid, you know, with a kid who probably has a stress fracture in her back. And she said, I'm not those parents who are going to make her do what, you know, things like, you know, like I'm not one of those crazy parents. It's just that I need to know if she's going to play this tournament in the next, next three months. And she needs to be at the academy because I'm putting me into that. And so like the people who don't think there's anything wrong are actually some of the ones who are the problem, problems behind it. So you need that right environment. And then, uh, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, and, and I, I actually want, uh, you know, to see what happens when we look at young athletes and their quality of life from different types of injuries. And Emily has helped tremendously with this. We have a large multi-center trial looking, looking at this in young athletes with Lurie Children's and Boston Children's. Um, and, you know, youth sports is great, has many health benefits, but right now, my opinion is that elite youth sports does not improve your health. And unfortunately, we're just not seeing it right now. And we have to, we have to change things a little bit to make it a better experience at the younger ages. Um, and then for you guys, remember, figure out how to understand the ads. I think, you know, I've learned a lot working with folks like Stephanie, who just totally understands the data. And, um, you know, she could spin circles around me with that. And she calms me down and says, you got to look at that. <laughs> you can't jump to conclusions. So, and use that data, counsel athletes and improve the environment. The data helps. You got to work with people like coaches and, and performance folks um, in order to make uh, make difference. You can't do this as medical providers on your own. And then you have to message it properly and simply like, you know, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And hey, one sport, the one sport injury that AOS, AOSSM is using. Um, and in the end, Sports was supposed to be for fun and let's not over, you know, let's not make this too complicated. Sports was for kids. It's not for adults to make kids do things. So let's just go back to the simple things. And, and then um, I think we'll make this a great, great uh, pack people. So I'll pass this on over to uh, Dr. Stephanie um, and she will go over our next important topic as well. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jayanti. Uh, you, did, you had a great setup for me, for sure. So thanks for inviting me to be part of this webinar. I have to first th thank Dr. Jayanti because he is really the reason why I am in this field and I, and I am the, it's the reason why I'm in my current position at AMSSM. So uh, sport, youth sport has a, a really uh, special place in my heart. I was a multi-sport athlete growing up and was fortunate enough to be a multi-sport athlete through college. And, and I think that that trend, and I know that trend has changed and is changing. And so I am just honored to be part of this on the back end now, really trying to uh, better understand the issues surrounding youth sports specialization. So my talk, uh, I'm just gonna take about 15 minutes with all of you, is really on the impact of specialization on athletic performance. We know that one of the driving factors for kids specializing at a young age is because they want to improve their athletic performance. They want to achieve those elite performance outcomes that uh, in terms of making it to the professional level or playing a sport in college. And we, so we really wanted to uh, see what, what evidence it, what evidence is out there that uh, really shows, agrees or disagrees with the role of youth sports specialization. So uh, this really stems, this talk stems from a conference that we put on last April of two, 2019 called the YES Summit, Youth Early Sports Specialization Summit. And this was uh, a really multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary conference looking at the effects of early sports specialization. The conference had two primary goals. One was to conduct a rigorous review of the research and identify 
uh, current scientific knowledge related to sports specialization, and also identify knowledge gaps. And then the second part of the second goal of this summit was to develop a research roadmap that we could use to, to drive future research efforts in the field of youth sport. So we have we are partway through our outcomes and our goals. Uh, we've we accomplished some of them and we're in the process of ac accomplishing others. But if you look here, um, some of these names may may be familiar to you. These are members of our, our leadership group that really looked at the literature and identified uh, our, our knowledge gaps. So that first group is really what I'm gonna talk about today is the child and athlete performance and development group. We also had groups working on injury risk and termination in terms of burnout or dropout due to injury. And then we had another group looking at uh, guidelines and recommendations that are put out by medical academies and or national governing bodies related to youth sports specialization. But as I said, we'll just focus today on the performance piece. So this all resulted in a systematic review that we published late last year, last November, and all the data that I'm gonna present today is can be found in this art, BJSM article for you. So what was the goal of our systematic review? We wanted to find all the literature pertaining to the effects of sports specialization and identify the effects of specialization on performance. Now, performance can be defined in different ways. We have career performance, which can include athletic achievement and or participation and success at the elite level. We defined success at the elite level as anything co collegiate or beyond. So college, professional sports, Olympics. And we also looked at task performance outcomes, though. So these are studies of human performance, movement biomechanics, not neuromuscular control, et cetera. We wanted to assess sport-specific skill development, but unfortunately, there is no literature uh, assessing those types of outcomes currently. So we, we really focused just on the neuromuscular and biomechanic outcomes. Um, so inclusion exclusion criteria you can see here, but the the really the main one that I want to point out to you is that we is the third one in that bullet. We ex we required an explicit measure of sports specialization. There's a lot of research on deliberate practice and sports sampling uh, that and training load and volume that uh, really corresponds quite nicely with this idea of sports specialization, but there are slightly different concepts. And so we really tried to keep our review very specific and looked at just those exposures that were articles that were looking at the exposure of sports specialization. So uh, maybe to your surprise or not, we only found 22 articles that met our criteria to be included and 15 of them were related to career performance outcomes and seven of them were related to task performance. One of the limitations to the research across the board of, of youth sports specialization is that most of the articles are cross-sectional or historical. There's very few longitudinal prospective cohort studies and Dr. Jayanthi really touched on the, the handful that exists because he's the one who's, who's been doing them. Um, so that's a real limitation from a methodological perspective in this field of research. Most of the reasons why we had to exclude articles from consideration was that there was no definition of sports specialization or the articles claimed to have a performance-based outcome, but they really didn't measure anything performance related. Another issue we have with sports specialization is how do we define it? We all conceptually know and understand what we mean by sports specialization and who that athlete is we're talking about, but it's much more difficult to be able to identify that and pinpoint that in a rigorous research related way. And Dr. Jayanthi has one of the most common uh, well-respected definitions of sports specialization. He has this three-point scale, which is the second up from the bottom. But the problem is it's not universally accepted or used in the literature. So we have multiple definitions. And in our systematic review, those top two that are highlighted in yellow, those are the two definitions that were used most frequently. Participation in a single sport or exclusive participation in a main sport. So could you choose a primary sport? Um, there are benefits and drawbacks to all of these, and it, it does make trying to combine the literature and established trends a, a lot more difficult when we can't when we don't have a validated, universally accepted definition of sports specialization. 
So Dr. Jayanthi actually alluded to this a little bit, but it's important to consider the athlete triangle, right? So coaches and parents are really the foundation of support for, for sport and kids. And if you look at this figure, I know it's kind of busy, but most coaches and parents understand the issue of sports specialization, more so on the coach's side than the parent's side. 70, 71% of coaches believe sports specialization is a problem, whereas only 55 of parents believe it's a problem. But overwhelmingly, the kids kind of like sports specialization, right? 91% believe that it will increase their chance of improving uh, in their selected sport, and they believe it'll help them make a collegiate team. So even though children and adolescents might be proponents of sports specialization, it's really important to engage the coaches and parents and educate them on the potential risks and concerns associated with sports specialization because they're really the foundation for their child participating and staying healthy in sport. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the career performance outcomes and what we found. We know that it, at the collegiate uh, level, about 30% of athletes were specialized. The, uh, and that's really common. That's I think Dr. Jayanthi re referred to that earlier, the, a number around there. And that's common in other populations as well, among youth and among adolescents or high schools. But so that seems to suggest that there are other factors for people or athletes making it to the collegiate level other than specialization. If those, if those rates are staying the same, there's no, they're not disproportionately uh, specializing is not leading them to an increased likelihood of making it to uh, collegiate participation. And this is also a busy slide. It's usually animated, but I, I PDF'd it for purposes of this webinar. What you can see here is that there's really large discrepancy in the age of specialization and the percentage of athletes who specialize by sport. And Dr. Jayanthi was alluding to this, that we really, there's a paucity of sport specific research affiliated with sport specialization. Most of the research looks at sports holistically, or it may look at team sports or some individual sports, but across the board, um, we really are, are missing sport specific research. And this figure clearly shows that specialization patterns are different by sport. So if you look at sports like baseball, they actually have the, they specialize at the latest age on average, about 15 years of age, whereas gymnasts and figure skaters are specializing at a much younger age. So I'd be remiss not to mention that there is some evidence that sports specialization can be beneficial in certain sports. Now, the methodolo methodologist in me says there are, there are limitations to these, uh, these studies that look at these specific sports, but the sports that suggest potential benefits include these, are, are really these sports where skill development peaks before puberty or at a younger age in some of the other sports. So we're thinking gymnastics, figure skating, diving, um, ice skating, those, those types of things, those types of sports. And I'm not gonna kind of go through this slide, but basically what this shows is that those athletes who engaged in more deliberate practice or more sport specific training uh, were more likely to achieve success at the elite level. So the first one is rhythmic gymnastics, which is the ribbon twirling. It's not um, it's not the the gymnastics that we we kind of regularly understand. Um, and it, it showed that those who made the Olympic level were were. They started specializing younger. Uh, they were involved in fewer activities as they were growing up, and they were spending more hours training in rhythmic gymnastics than those who made it to the international level but did not quite make it to the Olympic level. And similarly with figure skating, we saw similar similar results where the national team um, had practice on average quite a few more hours per week than, than the junior national team. There really is not a lot of research out there on professional athletes. Most of the literature on specialization is in the collegiate level or the Olympic level, but the, the articles that do exist are, are here. So in the NHL, there are really only two studies looking at specialization, and they they show quite different results. One study said 88% quit other sports for hockey, and one only said between 12 and 24% specialized at a young age who made it to the elite level of hockey, and primarily the NHL. 
The MLB is kind of interesting because 45%, only 45% of individuals surveyed quit another sport to focus on baseball. And if you recall, specialization in, at the uh, baseball occurred at the latest age. So these, these athletes are making it to the professional level for reasons other than specialization at an early age. And interestingly, there's one study in the NBA and although it found that 85% of first round draft picks played one sport in high school, it also showed that they were more likely to be injured and had lower career, less, their career longevity was shorter than those who were multiple, multiple sport athletes. So again, not a lot of literature in this area, but, but certainly there are other pathways to get to the elite level than just specializing at a young age. And Dr. Jayanthi alluded to this as well, but one of the main results of our, of our systematic review was that elite athletes are specializing at a later age than non-elite athletes or semi-elite athletes. So when you look at this uh, summary of the articles that were included in our systematic review, the gold column suggest, is, is our elite athletes and the age at which they specialize. And you can see that most of them are specializing 13 through 15 years of age compared to those who are not elite or their semi-elite counterparts who are specializing as young as nine years old and really majority are specialized before the age of 12 or 13 with a few exceptions. So let's now switch over to task performance outcomes. Like I said earlier, there really aren't sport specific skills that we were able to assess, but much more physical literacy, human performance movement, those kind of things we looked at. This review came out last November, and actually since this review came out, there has been a few additional publications, uh, primarily in the Journal of Athletic Training special, special issue on sport specialization. But the take home point here is that these studies looked at the effect of specialization on different types of task performances, including Y balance or the less test and fitness, other fitness and gross motor coordination skills, and really found no benefit for sports specialization. And in fact, in some cases, they found that sports specialization hindered some of these performances. And the literature is still quite mixed in this area because we just have too few studies looking at it, but there is some suggestion that females are potentially more affected uh, than males, especially in, in the literature that just came out recently in the, in the Journal of Athletic Training. Uh, the last study here at the bottom of this screen is actually quite interesting. So they looked at a cohort of kids over time and generally they, they looked at various outcomes so sit and reach tests push-ups shuttle runs standing broad jumps and they found no difference in sport specialized and or single sport and multi-sport athletes when you were six or eight years old or eight to ten years old but by the time you got to 10 to 12 years old they found that multiple sport athletes were actually performing better than single sport athletes in some of these um, coordination and fitness skills so it may not show, it may be this delayed effect where it may not show immediately and you may be developing skill in your given sport, but you may be compromising other sorts of coordination and physical literacy in, in doing so. So what are some of the conclusions that we made? Um, I'll start at the bottom here. We know that both specialized and non-specialized athletes achieve elite performance. So specialization is not the only pathway to, to achieve success at the elite level. And we also know that elite performers specialize later than non-elite, their non-elite counterparts. There are things that we kind of know, but the evidence is still growing and we need more, more research to back it up. And that's that sports specialization may not improve task related performance outcomes. And in fact, it may actually be detrimental. We just don't have a clear understanding of that yet, but we think that there may be some issues there. And we also know that the impact of sports specialization is probably sport specific, but we haven't teased out which sports uh, are of most concern and which are, are of lesser concern. And what we really don't have a good handle on are some of these really conceptual questions such as are multiple sport athletes simpler, but simply better athletes and so they make it to the elite level just because they're better athletes and those who specialized probably had to specialize for them to get to that point. We don't know the answer to that question. 
And we also really haven't been able to tease out the effects of volume or deliberate practice uh, on sports specialization. So we know that these concepts are important. They're slightly different and they're probably all interrelated, but we haven't uh, been able to really figure out the roles of each uh, in the, this phenomenon of sports specialization. So this is a really busy slide, and I'm sorry I cut this from our, of our from our paper. And so you can pull up our paper, and it looks like Emily was able to to pull up the the site for that. So thank you. Um, but some of our recommendations are: we really need some prospective research that allows us to assess these sports sampling and sports specialization pathways, and they should be sport specific. And so we're really encouraging prospective research as opposed to these historical cross sectional studies. Uh, we also need to look at sports specific associations. So uh, we've done so much on the grand, grand scheme of sports, but like I said, we don't know about some of these individualized sports such as gymnastics, diving, figure skating, swimming, uh, where there may be some benefit to specialization. And lastly, because I'm a methodologist and a biostatistician, we need to work on some of our research rigor. So defining a valid and consistent definition of youth sports specialization, as well as some of our outcomes, including injury and quality of life, making sure that there are appropriate standards in how we build this evidence base so that we can answer the questions we want to answer. So that's um, really kind of quick overview and of, of youth sports specialization and its effect on performance. So I think, Nehru, we can open it up to questions now. Yeah, we'll get, uh, yeah, we'll get Emily, uh, I think Emily, is going to moderate our questions, questions here. So. here so. But uh, while but, she's uh, pulling up here, up here um, um, you know, again, again for those, those Medical, medical students that are in residence that are around here. here. I will tell you, will tell you with the research, with the research um, ideas, ideas, and this is explored over the last kind of 10 years. years I say it. Talk, talk to your mentors to your at your institutions, institutions if anyone's, if anyone's in, in looking at a specific population. If you had interest in, in any, any particular sport, you were a gymnast, you were a swimmer, all of the population, you can start by distributing 100 of them and then getting a sense of what they are. really uh, we uh, have, have a lot of performance and injury risk injury questions, risk uh, questions being, uh, being asked. Ask. Um, and so while, um, while we have while Alan we have here, Alan we have a chance to talk to this panel, and then we'll um, um, pull up some But I'd love to hear Alan, Alan is the director of sports performance at the University of Houston for basketball, play football, and everything he has himself. I think the students would love, and the residents would love to hear your take on, you know, what does it work from a performance point of view? What are you telling your high-level college basketball athletes, you know, what What would you have wanted them to do when they were trying to go play college basketball? Yeah, you know, from a sports performance standpoint, I think there's there's a couple of things that, that everyone's going to value, and everyone's values are a little bit different in, in how they evaluate the programs. But I, I think the most important stat that we've found on the basketball side <clears throat> is that the number one indicator for wins and losses is starter minutes lost. And so essentially to simplify that, if you have your best players on the floor, you're more likely to win games, right? So when you're looking at starter minutes lost, when, when your best players are out with injury, you're less likely to win games. It's very, very simple. And so that's how you can get a lot of head coaches bought in to the thought process of why you want to do every avenue possible to reduce the risk of injury. And you said it correctly, there's no way to prevent, but I think the literature and the research, especially that you're you know, putting out for the world to see, is, is very clear that you can reduce the risk of injury with some very, very simple guidelines. And it's really interesting when you're looking at the basketball side of it, it's, you're always going to have seven footers. You're going to have kids that are six nine, six ten, and it's going to be very evident where their success is going to lie. That's on the basketball side of things. You know, there's not too many seven foot swimming divers out there. Um, and so, on the sports performance side of it, you've got to make sure that the strength coaches understand that the best way to continue development 
is to make sure that it's uninhibited, that it's consistent training, it's consistent development. And the number one way to derail training is through injury. And so when you start looking at it from a standpoint of on the youth side, you know, Doc, we had talked about it just the other day. Uh, you know, I'm in Texas and down here, football is its own religion. And they have football for five and six year olds, full pad, peewee football. Uh, it's, you know, and, and you'll have 300 family members watching practice. It, it really is its own different animal. But what's crazy about it is then there's now elite football. So after the football season is done, now you have elite. And then after elite's done, you have seven on seven, which is just quarterbacks throwing the ball to receivers. And then on top of that, they have personal trainers that are doing footwork and they're doing speed development. So now I think it's going to be really interesting because football and the, the economics of football, I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of these overuse injuries, and a lot more of the early specialization in the sport of football because there's such an economic impact on it and it's starting to develop that way. But you've got to get the parents to see the, the value in the multi-sport. And so one of the things that I do is I actually will tell any parent that listens, look, grappling sports like wrestling or jujitsu is the best early introduction to resistance training. So instead of doing football year round and now you're running these overuse injury risks, get them in a grappling sport. And instead of doing seven on seven camps, do track and field and go out and do some sprinting and learn some speed development that way. So it's just kind of finding ways that we all value the same things with our development and nobody wants their kid to fall behind. So you want your kid to develop, but you got to package it and frame it in a way so that the parents understand their kids are still getting ahead with development and they're not falling behind. But then more importantly, if college athletics is, are, are going to be the end result, and let's say a kid's good enough to get to that level. Well, now they're not going to be 18 years old getting to me and they're sputtering to me. And I'm getting kids in the building where we're already trying to fix problems rather than develop. Yeah. That's awesome insight. And, and I'm going to just run through Emily, unfortunately, got kicked off for a computer. She needs to upgrade, I guess, and you know, on the poor student's stipend. But I'm going to run through real quick these uh, questions we have. So the students who ask, throwing sports seem to be always a concern in early sports specialization. Do we still think these sports are a larger issue? This is Nate McKinney. It all depends on who you ask. And you know, uh, um, I think there these technical overuse problems in baseball pitchers and tennis player and baseball pitchers gets a lot of media. Um, so it's certainly a component. But as Stephanie outlined, baseball actually by the current data is not really a specialization risk. It's actually just pitchers with volume. Volume is the biggest risk. In tennis, it is a big risk. And I can tell you all about that if you're bored and you have three hours because I have so much data on that and tennis players. Um, another uh, question uh, was, this is a good question for, uh, I'll leave this for Stephanie. This will be our last uh, question because we, um, we have a Twitter thing. Maybe we have one more after that. Um, how do you convince clinical researchers to agree on a universal definition of sports specialization? Of sports specialization. I wrote an editorial on I that and I'm going, going back with Stephanie and one other, uh, and one other um, uh, Don Cote. Uh, well, what do you think, Stephanie? What do you think, Stephanie? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer is you don't, unless we have a validated definition. And so actually, um, this is in the works to, to, to develop a validated universal definition of sports specialization. Um, but oftentimes, the researchers are using the, the one that makes most sense to them or one that they're most familiar with. But we're not going to come up with a universal definition of sports specialization until we have that validated measure. And that's a whole different field of research that we need to incorporate and involve experts from different fields to help make that happen. So stay tuned. Hopefully within a year, we will have a better, more evolved definition, beginning with what Dr. Jayanti has already, has already identified for us. And just realize in medicine, you can't get everyone to agree on one thing. You just want to get most people to agree on something. <laughs> so that's a good answer. Maybe the last one, Rachel, uh, that was from Catherine, that last question. Rachel says, she asked me if, if you use examples of how to identify a number of practices and identifying risk for injury, does that include other things like weightlifting? So we, it all depends on how you survey the, uh, your population. So we normally don't include exercise and weightlifting. Um, 
but it should be you know additional so either you add only the organized sports and i think it depends what you're doing you have someone smart like uh, coach allen they're the stuff they're doing probably improves their chances and decrease their injury risk while other people are doing things improperly and the injury risk normally don't include that in our training load but it is a consideration as we do future studies so um so on that note i think we should conclude it exactly at nine because we have a twitter chat now i invite all of you hopefully you go to uh, hashtag yes with y-e-s-s-s 2020 and then get on uh the three of us will be on our amos and we'll moderate and you can actually ask more questions through the twitter chat we're going to kind of run through it systematically over the next 60 minutes thank you guys coach Alan, Dr. Stephanie, and uh, and Amos Semper. Thank you all for being this. present.